morning. Buen día, Mati. <laughs> ¿Qué tal? Dobro jutro. Morning, everyone. Morning. So, okay. Uh, so today I have the pleasure to present Tamara Kolaric, who, who I met, uh, well, uh, eight years ago on TRES uh, at the Summer School of Transitional Justice. And I really appreciated her work. She, she was still working on her PhD and she eventually got her PhD from the C University, Central European University in Budapest. And uh, well, after that, she worked in Berlin for one year and now she's assistant professor with the School of Applied Language and Intercultural Studies at Dublin City University in Dublin. And she uh, does her work around well, the intersection of political science, collective memory and, and film. And today she will, she will present her, her work, uh, well, her PhD uh, on the creation of film and the homeland war or the war in 1990s, which is locally called the homeland war. But I think that Tamara will, will explain it much better than I do. Uh, she's, uh, she was also an editor of Film On Out, which was a, uh, uh, cinema cinema journal here in Croatia. So she knows a lot about movies. She's the best uh, consultant about the quality of movies that you want to watch in general, but she always has a very critical eye. And it's very interesting how she does this intersection between political science, collective memory and film, especially uh, while well applied to the to how the, the Homeland War was presented in, in Croatian cinematography. So Without uh, further uh, ado, I will give the floor to Tamara. And Tamara, thank you for, for joining us at the SAS seminar. Thank you very much, Ukraine, for the wonderful introduction and for some spoilers, actually, uh, that are coming in the presentation as well. And thank you, everyone, for, for coming. I'm very happy to be here and to talk about my work. And I do have a PowerPoint, but before I actually start talking, I wanted to ask a question to the audience. And that is, if anyone has actually Actually, and I know because of you who are from Croatia, I have certainly have, but if anyone else has actually seen a Croatian film, because one of the downsides of talking about films as research material is that we all get really excited about films that we've seen. And sometimes it can be really, really tedious to listen about films we haven't actually seen. And I will be talking a lot about films that many of you haven't seen today. And so I was thinking about what would be the best way to do that. Should I show you clips? Shouldn't I? But if we would be here forever. And Nicolina knows that I talk a lot in general. I will try to not um, talk uh, too much and, and feel very free to also interrupt me at, at some point if I'm going a little bit overboard. But I was curious, has anyone, you feel free to raise your hand or just jump in. Um, has anyone seen a film from Croatia? <laughs> Apart from Nicolina and Marco. Ah, Puto Benita, which we won't be talking about today, but which actually is uh, also a very interesting film from the perspective of what we will be uh, talking about today. So there is this understanding uh, that creation films are all about the war and all very boring. And we will try to kind of um, challenge actually both of those assumptions um, today as I take you through my, um, what is actually my doctoral dissertation. And I'm still working on similar issues, but they're a little bit too niche. And I, I kind of appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit broader what I will try to do is give you an insight into what I did. Let me actually share my screen uh, so that you can see what we will cover today. Um, but also, I will try to do that with a little bit of a critical, um, well, I hope not too much of critical reflection. And I will try to challenge myself in the process and admit to points where I think I should have done so somewhat better or much better. And the first part of that admission actually comes with the title of this presentation. So when I was defending my PhD, I titled it something like Hidden Dialogues with the Past, uh, Creation Cinema and the Homeland War. And back then there was no question mark behind the hidden dialogues because I was very certain that the hidden dialogues are actually happening. Now, looking back at it, I have a little bit of a dilemma about my own interpretive framework and about whether it was the best interpretive framework to give us the most in insight into what I wanted to know. So there's a question mark and uh, feel very free to uh, kind of critically respond to that question mark 
while I'm talking, feel free to interrupt me. I am incredibly bad at multitasking, so I probably won't notice if there's a hand up, but Nicolina or Marco can freely interrupt me um, if there's a question while I'm talking. And absolutely feel free to give me your impressions on this. This PhD is a little bit of a strange beast because normally what we do is that we finish a PhD and we can't wait to publish it. And mine is somehow still waiting um, to turn into something. Uh, so, so in a way, it's still a work in progress. Um, and so what is this work in progress that I will be talking about today? What we will talk about today, here's a rough roadmap of my presentation. And I will tell you a little bit about the context that got me to doing this work. And Nicolina already mentioned some and about the empirical puzzle that I started from. Um, I will talk about my research question or my research questions because theoretically I had two, but one of them was very easy for me to answer already when I started. I just wasn't entirely sure of how much war there is in Croatian cinema, but I knew that there was. I will talk a little bit about the literature gap um, that led me to design this research as I did. I will try not to bore you with this too much. And I will talk then about my framework, which is the theoretical framework, but I think it also is a kind of broader, I think of memory studies as a particular um, way of seeing a particular framework in itself rather than a discipline. There was at one point, there was a lot of discussions on whether this is a discipline, this is a framework, this is a, there's a concept, sensitizing concepts. And by now, I, I feel a little bit uncomfortable with my insistence in the thesis that this is a concept. This is, I think, a framework or lens of seeing. So we will talk about this a bit, and then we will talk about why I think this is the best approach and, and how does this creation narrative fit into that. What I won't be talking about much is actually the history of the war itself, because I, I follow the schedules of these seminars, and so I already assume that everyone will be uh, more or less familiar. Uh, with this because they do the homeland war of the 1990s does come up pretty often there is a question there is a, a quotation marks on top of my homeland war i will tell you why also later i will quickly take you to my research design um, and then i will have a long discussion of my findings which i will try to maybe cut down a little bit if we get tired because there's a lot of i think nuance and a lot of complications um in what i find and, and, and in a way it's a bit it's a very rich on the one hand, and on the other, it's a little bit uh, perhaps um, narrowed by the kind of approach that I take, uh, which is always a risk with any approach. You will never capture everything. And then finally, I will try to, because of the, the, the end point of my dissertation, so I looked at films up to 2000, with the end of 2014, for technical reasons that I will also explain, but we will try to see if this is still meaningful if this discussion that I was having back then is still meaningful to understand films now and uh, try to kind of critically reflect if we still have the time on my findings. But to give you a little bit of context, so how this thesis even came to be, there is this uh, notion of positionality in qualitative research and it doesn't quite apply to me because I was doing qualitative research with material that weren't human participants, so it's a little bit different, but I think I do have a strong positionality. For one, I am myself Croatian. Uh, but when I entered my PhD program, I had no intention of doing a, a thesis on um, anything related to Croatia. In fact, I was on track to do a thesis on uh, European identity, which I was very interested in, which I had spent decades kind of um, trying to understand, and I was very keen on, on doing this. But simultaneously with starting my PhD, I ended up almost by accident um, taking over the role of a co-editor of a film magazine. So I was literally asked by a friend who had started it. It was then an online magazine. And he said, I want to bring in two people to do it instead of me. Would you be interested? I'm very much a film fan. I'm a big film, lo film lover. Uh, but I didn't necessarily think of myself as, as an editor. But I said, yes, this sounds like a fun project. And that fun project actually led me to see while I was doing my preliminary research, passing my exams for my PhD, that there's something interesting going on in Croatian cinema, that it is a very rich material. I was eyeing it constantly because I was working on it. I was telling other people what to write, what they need to pick up on. Um, and so I, I kind of constantly had this um, observation in a way. And I thought, well, this is very interesting. And then I started noticing something else. You probably see this image in the center is actually a film poster and it's a film poster for a film that came out in 2014 that we will come back to, number 55, which is very explicitly about the homeland war. And what struck me 
at the time when this film appeared was that there was a lot of discussion. I didn't know anyone who had actually seen this film, but there was a lot of discussion in the media at one point about this film. And the discussion was that the film was seen by groups of Croatian veterans who had said that their film wasn't very good and it wasn't very good because there weren't enough rosaries in it on the soldiers. I thought, well, this is a really strange objection. Where is this coming from? Why are we evaluating films um, in this way? Is there a story there? And then the third part of the um, story that got me to researching this was actually, some of you might recognize uh, this image because I know that many of you are uh, right now, at least in theory, because basically I know for many it's impossible, on Tres. And in 2014, I found myself um, accidentally stumbling upon memory studies literature. And uh, I did not know anything about this field at the time. I was completely unfamiliar with it. But I thought, this sounds very interesting. And it sounds like a very interesting perspective on what is going on in these films. I might want to look into this. And so I applied for what I think was the second school on transitional justice and collective memory, which was actually my first, where I met Nicolina as well, but it was also my first serious insight into the literature of collective memory. And so all of these three things put together led me to ask the question, well, why are these veterans so upset by um, this film? Why is there so much discussion about a film that nobody has actually seen yet? It hasn't actually come out. It was only screened to certain groups. It then went on um, to achieve, it says here on the poster, eight golden arenas, which is a big award that you can get at the National Film Festival, including the main prize uh, for the best film. But still, it didn't seem like we were, people were watching these films so much, and yet there was so much discussion. So I got interested in saying, so what are these films doing to what these people are talking about? They're talking about the representation of the war. What are these films doing? To the representation of the war, or what might they be doing? So this led me to my research questions. And so the first question that I asked was actually quite obvious for me already, was because I was you know, eyeing the films that were coming out of Croatia at the time, was is the war present as a relevant to topic in contemporary Croatian cinema at all? And when I say cinema, what I mean is feature-length fiction. When I say feature-length fiction, I mean films that are longer than 60 minutes, and that base themselves on fictionalized narratives. Now, the boundary between documentary filmmaking and fiction filmmaking is sometimes very, very porous. But my intention was really to look at films that are uh, undeniably labeling themselves as fiction. So invented stories which gave them the possibility of say, at least in theory, anything, thematize anything that they wanted to in any way that they wanted to. And then my second question is, well, if war is present in these films, how is it present? How is it addressed? And what is it saying or doing that is making certain societal groups so enraged? This, by the way, this story of number 55 was not the only one. When I was wrapping up my um, PhD, there was a story about another film, whether a film called, uh, oh, the, the title eludes me right now, but it was a comedy about the widows of Croatian veterans, whether this film should be screened on Croatian television or not. And what was particularly interesting is that there was Ministry a of Love. Ah, the Ministry of Love. And what was particularly interesting about the Ministry of Love was that at one point, so there was this uh, organi women's organization protesting against it being shown on TV. And at one point, after a couple of days of debates, which the media, of course, stretched far and wide, somebody said, a representative of this organization said, I haven't even seen the film, but even the title is really rubbing me the wrong way. And I thought, ha, ah, this is still going on. Maybe there is something to what I'm seeing. So these were the two questions that I had when I started doing my research. Now, why was I doing this? Well, the obvious answer is because nobody else was really at the time. So there was a lot of literature on the so-called homeland war. When I say homeland war, again, you notice these marks on the side. What I mean is the so-called Croatian War of Independence between 1991 and 1995 which was following the process of the breakup of Yugoslavia. The war very early on got the name Homeland War uh, as a kind of official narrative. I use the quotation marks to say that I don't actually endorse this name. I don't actually endorse what it entails, which is that it is a very particular war that took place. And we'll talk about this narrative in a second. But because this label is so familiar and so well represented in, in Croatian public discourse, I thought it was the best way of labeling 
this war. So a five year or four year long war, which effectively was a war for um, a year, year and something. And then again, a couple of months, um, a very long period of relative peace um, in between, um, which changed or really defined um, the Croatian uh, narrative of what Croatia is, which is what brings the memory literature on it. There's a lot of literature um, by historians um, on it by now in different dimensions, what had happened, who had been responsible for what had happened. And there was also, by the point that I'm starting my PhD, a huge amount of literature on the memory of that war. So how are we, from the perspective of the present, thinking about what happened during this war? And this literature and memory looks at various um, aspects of how memory was created from the official narratives by politicians, uh, history books, um, so-called politics of memory, how space changed in the process of moving away from Yugoslavia to the independent Croatia, um, how history books changed, what were the political talks, and one of the most important elements of this also, how was this narrative impacted by the ICTY, many of you will already know, the court um, that was in charge since 1993 to put on trials those who were um, said to commit um, crimes during wars in the former Yugoslavia, including in Croatia. So all of this is very much covered. But the literature and film is not looking at this at all. What it is in fact looking at is three things. One it is looking at the ideological narratives in the 90s. So what is going on? in the 90s while the war is still on. But it doesn't take that further into the post 90s period. Secondly, a lot of this literature focuses on looking at the whole of former Yugoslavia. This usually means also looking at very individual uh, picked out films that are for some reason most important or seen as most inventive, most relevant, and dissecting the ideology that was represented in these films. Effectively, what this means is that very few of these films are Croatian because there are two other conflicts, um, well, three, four, and then some later on happening pretty much in, in similar time period. And all of them are cinematically seen as usually more interesting than what is going on in Croatia. So films from Croatia, it's very little attention. And they're very often processed through the same concept. And that concept is trauma. Now, trauma is an extremely, as everything in memory studies, is an extremely complex um, concept that covers a lot of different renditions. And it's a very useful one to unpack cinema. But I didn't want to write again about the representation or about the appearance and processing of trauma in a few particular films. What I was really interested in is, well, if I look at films, all films in this particular period, how are those films in dialogue with what I know about the Homeland War um, 10 years later, 15 years later? So what I and the rest of the society remembers about the Homeland War. And so what was the framework that I was working with? Again, very, very broad and then going more narrowly. Obviously, the framework of collective memory. Why collective memory? Because ultimately, the discussions that were going on back then in Croatia were discussions about identity. What is the identity of this new country? And what is our, quote unquote, our Croatian identity? in this period. And how are films, when, when films are discussed, talking about whether there's a rosary, whether there's a, an adequate representation of the soldier from this period and what the soldier looked like, behaved like, whether it is fair to talk about widows in a comedic manner, how are films contributing to that identity? What are films doing to that identity? So I was very keen on tapping into that. And you see probably here that it says collective cultural memory. This is because the term collective memory is in a way broader than the term cultural memory. And I didn't know yet when I was starting my research that the cultural memory was going to be what I was going to focus on. Now the difference, collective memory, any kind of um, societal memory on any, um, any level, whether personal memories, that are um, always a little bit societally constructed or memories that are uh, brought up through artifacts. I ended up being more interested in the second part, it's artifacts. So the framework that I chose primarily relying the work of um, Ali Danya Nasman, who looks specifically at cultural memory, they say, well, cultural memory is really memory of artifacts. It's a long-term memory. It is not a memory of, of uh, oral transmission. It is a memory of 
things that we give meaning to that we interpret. Alida Atman also has an extremely useful distinction that was very useful for me between political and cultural memory as different memory formats. Now, political memory would mean memory top down. Um, for those of you who are maybe political scientists, this would sound a little bit off. I did, and I'm not sure if I mentioned in the beginning that I'm a political scientist. So politics, when political scientists talk about politics, they don't necessarily talk just about institutional politics. Uh, the phrase, everything is political, that we took from the feminists uh, encapsulates this very nicely. But in Alida Asman's notion of political memory, political is pretty much institutional political. What kind of um, discourse of the past do political institutions create through a process of politics of memory that changes, impacts, shapes the way that we remember a particular historical period or that we see ourselves as a collective group. Um, cultural memory, on the other hand, so very much top down, long duration, very stable narrative. Cultural memory, on the other hand, think of it as more horizontal memory, which comes from various sources, from various contributions, um, depending on what is um, of interest as a topic at a particular point in time, very simplified. Um, the difference between the two is not always clear cut, uh, especially in the Croatian case, um, because we're talking also about a situation um, in which, um, how do I even put this? So a lot of these films, especially during the 90s when the original narrative was created, were funded by the state. When something is funded by the state, it is very often also endorsed by the state. So the porosity of boundaries between political and cultural memory is sometimes a little bit questionable uh, in the Croatian case. But the very basics that I was interested in is how these two memories um, interact, where do they intersect, and what do they do to each other? And so my question was, how do I do this? How do I look at this? Uh, so I thought of cultural memory, as I already mentioned, always mediated uh, in words, words as a original media, but also in images, in my case in film, in objects, but always mediated, to an ex um, always mediated um, in the public space. Very dynamic, changeable, a lot more dynamic than political memory. And something that is very specific to my, my approach, but isn't endorsed by everyone, striving towards a kind of narrative. And somebody might think, well, not everything that we, um, not everything that we uh, talk that we endorse as part of cultural memory, that we talk as part of cultural memory is a narrative in itself. A photograph is not a narrative. But what we do when we make memory is that we interpret this photograph within a certain framework. And so I wanted to see how can I look at, can I, to begin with, can I look at films as part of memory in the sense, obviously primarily cultural memory, but also influencing political memory. And so I borrowed um, ideas from James Birch, who some of you might be familiar with. And James Birch says, well, memory happens between, he's interested in individual memory, but he says memory happens between individual and textual resources in a society. And those textual resources are what we take over, uh, we interpret in speech, we use. So we don't have cultural memory just by being ourselves. We learn the cultural memory primarily from textual resources. Now, if we do that, that means that we have memory narratives. And we usually have says, two different kinds of narratives. One is an, a particular narrative of a particular period. So a story of what has happened. And this is just a narrative. The other one is an equal schematic narrative template. So schematic narrative templates are narratives that function as kind of meta narratives that give structures to the kinds of stories that we tell. And when I was looking at Croatian, memory of the homeland war, what seemed to me is that oddly enough, it worked at the same time, both as a dominant narrative, so the kind of top-down narrative of what had happened, which has become very widespread in society, but also as a narrative template, because it was shaping all our dialogues about what was going on in Croatia. It was very hard to be off from. And when you did, when you would challenge this, and I thought, you know, with this lack of rosary, you would immediately get the response. So maybe what the films are doing are responding to this dominant narrative, but at the same time, they're shaped by the dominant narrative and they keep conversing to it. There is no, um, there's not much veering off from it. So this was the kind of framework that I adopted. 
one last thing to explain on this. So films are in a constant process of dialogue, but that dialogue is to an extent hidden because films don't cite politicians, but they keep talking to the narrative that we already have. And what I was interested in seeing is what kinds of talks are they doing? What were these films? Were these films memory objects? That is a very difficult question for me to answer actually, because in a way they were sitting between what again, Alida Asman calls the archive and the canon. So the canon are the, the um, cultural objects that constitute memory at a certain point in time. The archive is everything else that might constitute that memory, but at a particular point in time, it is not being integrated. It is not being interpreted. Now, these films had a strange positioning because as I already mentioned, very often we would talk in public, there would be discussions in public about films nobody has seen. At the same time, there was very little discussion of the actual content. So they sat very uncomfortably somewhere in between. So when I look at them, I look at them not necessarily as memory objects. I look at them as memory offerings, as narratives that talk to another narrative and that might or not might not be a part of memory. Um, what narrative are they talking to? So when I'm talking about this dominant political top-down memory narrative of the homeland war, what I'm talking about is roughly this situation. So the initial situation of Croatia coming at a crossroad to realizing independence in 1991. This is then interrupted by an overpowering aggressor attack. And this aggressor is attacking the whole of the nation. The whole of the nation, so not particular individuals, take on the role of the victim. But through heroism against all odds, considering a much stronger enemy, who from the beginning, by the way, identified as Serbian, so this is not a question of some kind of civil war, this is a country on country aggression. Uh, the nation itself resurfaces, defeats the aggressor in a manner that is purely defensive, heroic, and just. You can probably see that I highlighted a couple of these terms in the presentation because these are the terms that I'm considering the most important when I'm talking about this narrative. But ultimately, it's a very simple story about what has happened that goes from um, a very tragic situation, um, actually a very positive situation, opening up to something new, that is then interrupted in a very tragic way that concerns the whole body of the nation. So not just particular individuals, and yet then comes the heroism, then comes um, the great act of defeat of this aggressor in a manner that is, again, very defensive, purely defensive, um, that is heroic, and that is, um, in that sense, also ethically um, justifiable, completely just. This kind of narrative is uh, what I deem, again, taking the channel from literature, also very monologic. Monologic here just means that there is no um, side stories to this narrative. There is no questionings of whether some elements might have not been purely defensive, for example, Croatian participation in the war in Bosnia, whether some elements might have been not pure heroic, whether there have been cases of war crimes in the Croatian uh, war narrative as well. Uh, also, there is no possibility of attack, of um, dismantling the whole wholeness of the nation that is a character here. Um, so there's only one possible line to take. And this line is very simple, it's very straightforward. It is usually depicted as very linear. So it went from point A to point B, there are no detours. And so how did this narrative come to be? Because I'm making a pretty big claim here, which is that all films are talking to this narrative and are at the same time kind of shaped by this narrative. Now that is a long story in itself, which I think is extremely important, but I don't have that much time to dwell into it. But it comes primarily from how the talk of the war has been set up in Croatia from the beginning. So in the period of the war itself, there are three things happening, primarily, a strong amount of media control, which very much shapes the kind of narrative that happens. There's a strong amount of discouragement of any kind of opposing voices. There's very good literature in IR on this. Uh, for example, uh, Gagnon's fantastic book on how the Croatian, Serbian, and Bosnian governments all demobilized any kind of dissent uh, within their own ranks on what was going on and what was supposed to be going on in these countries striving for independence or protecting, in the case of Serbia, protecting their own national from others to not live as a, as a minority in their own state. 
So those are the two things. And then the third thing is a kind of combination of the two that essentially comes down to a form of, I wouldn't necessarily say opportunism, but actual belief in this. So when you create a very strong and powerful narrative, that narrative also tends to be believed in. And what was very interesting in Croatia, and you can see this not only in movies, but also in music, for example, that very often the kind of narrative that was produced outside of the political, the narrow political discourse was endorsing this story, whether for opportunistic reasons or for actually believing in this story, for finding the narrative very convincing. So it becomes a very strong narrative already during the war. And then it goes on. It goes on by being, I think it was 1991 when the first time this narrative was actually, well, still in development. So it's 1991. We don't actually know how the war is going to unfold. While the narrative is still in development, it is already protected by a constitutional declaration. Uh, this happens a number of times more, but the key point happens in late 2000 when there is an actual declaration on the homeland war that legally protects this narrative as the only possible narrative in Croatia. Five years later, you get also a narrative on the biggest uh, military operation that takes place during the homeland war. So we legally codify this narrative. We also codify this narrative in education. Uh, in 1993, it was the first time that they started teaching in Croatian primary schools the homeland war as a topic and as a topic that was framed in this manner. So it's 1993. We don't even know yet how the war is going to end. But we already know that it is purely defensive, heroic, and just. So on various levels in society, we are creating the repetition of this same narrative, including um, to a large extent in cinema, including in music. And uh, for those of you who are actually interested in film and maybe in music, there's a very interesting documentary from a couple of years ago that depicts this phenomenon. And the author goes to talk to a number of musicians who were very popular during the 90s. And one of them who was actually manager for the band that was the most popular at the time simply said, so this is where the money was. So this is where we went. We produced songs that supported this kind of national narrative because this is what was opportunistic. So that's how the narrative which then continues. So what did I actually do? Are you still with me? I hope you are. What did I actually do? Two very simple things. In the first stage, I collected all obtainable feature fiction films that were made in the period from 2001, when the war definitely moves from being ongoing to becoming memory, uh, because the last um, reintegration of areas in Croatia was actually uh, 1988. So this very prolonged feeling that the war is and has ended, but hasn't yet ended. But in 2001, there's also a change of political circumstances in Croatia. There's a change of government that is very important. So there's a change of political circumstances. There's also definitively a break with the idea that the war is, in a sense, ongoing. To 2014, which was a practical limitation, um, it is very hard, as I learned in the process, to obtain copies of Croatian films, very often for uh, production reasons, for ownership rights reasons, for the reasons that the companies that made the film no longer exist. So I went up to the point where I could still reach data that I needed. And I had a total of 112 films. And what I did was just basic thematic analysis, which is that I went to the data and said, okay, let me see what themes are represented in this film. And let me see if war is one of those themes. Now, usually when you do thematic analysis, which is just an organization of your data body based on different uh, themes that appear in it, you wouldn't say, okay, let me single out a particular team and these particular um, uh, data sources, whatever they might be, interviews, films. But I did, because I was particularly interested in this one theme, and that theme was war, which ended up showing in four different ways, which I then kind of combined into three different groups. And I said, okay, now that I know that there are these 38 films that thematize the war, let me go through all of these films, and let me see how they are in dialogue with the dominant narrative. What are they doing? So I basically analyzed the texts of all of these films, including both the visual elements, narrative elements, kind of deep film readings. This was expected to be um, a very messy analysis. And when I say messy analysis, what I mean is that literature teaches us that unlike political memory, which is very well structured, when we respond to political memory, we don't respond in full narrative. So we don't say, let me start and rewrite the story of the war entirely. But what we do is that we respond in elements that tackle 
parts of that narrative. And that's what I did when looking at trying to find those, those elements rather than a full, you know, no film is going to retell the whole world for you. So this was a focus on both form and content. And I ended up looking, some of you may be familiar with this term, sensitizing concepts. So sensitizing concepts, uh, Herbert Bloomer, who uh, originally came up with this idea, he says, are not concepts to tell you exactly what to search for, but guide you where to look. So when we look at a certain corpus of data, we can see many, many things depending on where we direct our gaze. And some of the things where, that I directed my gaze at was, for one, what is the story? What is the difference between, is there a difference between the story and the plot and what is that telling me? Who are the main characters? And here, my principal concept was this notion of the hero. Who is the hero and how is the hero depicted? Going back to the dominant narrative, the hero is somebody who is the center of the story. Usually that hero is a veteran, soldier, but the hero can also be a mother. The hero can also be a nurse. The hero is a person that significantly contributes to the narrative unfolding as it does. And then the other thing that I was very interested in was the depiction of the enemy and something that I called narrative ownership. Who is this discourse speaking for? When I watch the film, can I tell whose story this is? And by that, I don't just mean um, who of the characters are telling the story or who is the narrator in the film, but can I tell somehow, and this is a little bit, I, I admit this is one of the weakest conceptualizations in the pieces, can I tell somehow whom this narrative is said to belong to? Is this a national Croatian narrative? Is this just the story of us and them in a battle, but we don't know who us and them necessarily are? Can I see whom the narrative belongs to? And this led me to having three groups of films identified. Films dealing with the past, films bypassing the past, and films assuming the past. Nicolina, how am I doing on time? Probably horribly. Well, you have like five or 10 more minutes for the Malcolm say. <laughs> We can go on for like 15 more minutes. If... Okay, great, great. I will try to not cover all of this in detail then, because this is kind of the most interesting part, the most difficult to convey as well, because I'm going to be talking about- It's a pleasure to, to listen to you, so we can, we can go on. Sure. I'm mostly going to be talking about films that people haven't seen, which is a little bit of pain on my side, because I want to tell you how. I also want you to keep in mind when I'm talking, I'm not talking from the perspective of somebody who's evaluating the aesthetics of this film, in the sense that this is a good film, this is a bad film. Although there's very often, there's the film critic in me who is very keen on doing this, but this is not the core of the project. So films dealing with the past, the first group of films that takes a very particular strategy. So these are the films that directly engage themselves with the dominant narrative. And they engage themselves is what in one of the four ways. So there are three different sub-strategies. They either expose this narrative as incomplete, they expose it as a kind of fraudulent, um, they expose it as a, let's say, without a valid claim to a singular truth, or they embrace the narrative. And they embrace the narrative, when I say embrace the narrative, that's actually easy, the easiest. They tell a story, tell a narrative that's actually in alignment with the dominant narrative. So there's three and three different critical strategies and one affirmative strategy. And the three different critical strategy I call direct dialogue, failed polyphony, rejection through silence, rejection through trauma silence, a particular kind of silence, and again, affirming the dominant narrative. My favorite example of the first group is this film that you see on screen, which is a wonderful um, 2009 film called Thirty or the Blacks by um, directorial duo of Zvonimir Juric and Gordon Derich. And what this film does um, is something that I think is kind of really remarkable. So this is a film that tells a story about a unit of Croatian soldiers called the Black, which are somewhere in Eastern Slavonia at some point in the very early 90s. And we see these soldiers at the beginning of the film we understand that they're on a mission and they're on a mission to retrieve the dead bodies of their um, unit, former unit members. And we watch them walk around this forest, lost, it's raining, they cannot find the bodies. And we think, okay, so this is the story of the film. But then something happens. They all end up dying. And after about 30 minutes of the film, the film goes back in time. And it tells us what happened with these soldiers. And for the first one third of the film, we look at these soldiers as if they are war heroes. They're familiar figures to us. We recognize them. 
from familiar videos that you've seen on television. In this particular case, and this is actually not my conclusion, but uh, from Yuri Zapavicic, who wrote, I still think, the best book on film and, and uh, ideology in the former Yugoslavia. In this particular case, we recognize the image because we've seen it on television before, because it was a part of a very prominent set of images that were played on Croatian national television between programs depicting soldiers moving through forests, through different spaces. So what does this film do once it goes back in time? Effectively, it challenges the dominant narrative on three different levels. In one way, it challenges it in structure. So by the fact that it breaks after the first turn and it goes back, what it tells us is the following. Here's the narrative that you're, you're seeing this for the first third of the movie. You are convinced that this is going to play out as a narrative of the brave Croatian soldiers. But I'm taking you back and revealing what happened behind it. And what happened behind this, you learn, is that this is an extremely dysfunctional unit that is committing war crimes in the basement. Um, and they've lost the soldiers in the previous, previous day, also in very questionable, very complicated circumstances. So what I'm showing you, or what they are showing us, the two directors, is that under the narrative that you're familiar with, there's a different narrative. So on a structural level, by breaking the narrative in half, they're reminding us that the narrative that we expected to see that we're familiar with is in fact not true. So the dominant narrative is deceptive. It's also deceptive on a different level, and that is both topic and structure. And that deception is there's war crimes going on. So the narrative about justness of the homeland war, about it being purely victorious, just defensive, is also untrue. It also complicates, the film also complicates the main character in the dominant narrative, and that is the character of the hero soldier. So the film starts with you seeing the soldiers sitting in what looks like a small vehicle. And they're looking at, they're sitting in the dark and they're looking at the store. And two of them come out and you see that they break a shop window and they're stealing some bananas. And at first you're thinking, you know, whatever, this is a period of, this is a set, setup of war. The soldiers are hungry, this is fine. But once you come to the middle of the film, when it breaks up and it goes back, you realize that this is not an element of innocent mischief. What the film is telling you is you have an idealized image of these hero soldiers, and that idealized image is wrong. So in a way, it breaks up the dominant narrative through the structure. It also breaks it through the characters. And of course, obviously, on the level of the story. Now, when it comes to narrative ownership, whose story is this? Dempsey is never told in ethnic category, but we are actually quite clear on whom the story is about. So this is a Croatian story. And when there are Serbian characters who are catalysts for the whole story, and that is the discovery that there are war crimes committed in the basement and the victims are Serbian civilians, those characters are not a part of the film. They're catalysts for our story. So while this is not necessarily a nationalist film, in fact, it breaks up the nationalist narrative. It still keeps within the confines of what is a national story. So this is one story. Then there's a very similar, but added layer sub-strategy, uh, which I think is best represented by this film. This is a film called Svedolci by Vinko Bresen from 2003. And this is a film that also tries to engage, apart from doing pretty much the same as Sensi, uh, in terms of structure, in terms of story, it also tries to add another layer. And that's another layer is what they call failed polyphony. Now, polyphony is another term that I borrow from Mikhail Bakhtin, um, whose idea of dialogicality I take over from James Verge. And that's why I'm talking about films and dialogue with the dominant narrative in the first place. And polyphony essentially means that in a text, you're able to hear different competing voices. And none of those voices are necessarily the voice of the author. Now, in Bastin's version of polyphony, the polyphony itself should be a part of the creative process. I don't think this is a realistic goal to invest, um, evaluate in the first place, because I can't see the process of making of the film. But I can see the end point. I can see the final product. And in this particular film, and another film by Vinko Bresha, who is in the same category, there is again a novel story introduced. It is the first film that dealt with Croatian war crimes. Uh, it came out in 2003, which is pretty late. Uh, and it is the first film that openly deals with creation war crimes. 
it is also a film that deals with the war crimes story in a very particular form of narrative. It fragments this narrative and it has a very Rashomonic structure. So you see the same, it's a story about a small town in which a unit of soldiers who are set to be sent to the battlefield effectively go and terrorize a local Serb businessman. It goes wrong and they accidentally end up killing him. They end up kidnapping his daughter, who is the only witness to this occurrence, and they want to kill her as well. And that eventually gets stopped by the brother of one of these soldiers. See what I told you when I said that it's a little bit inconvenient when you're talking about films nobody has seen? All of this must sound a little bit confusing, but bear with me. So what the film does, again, nonlinear narration points to the fact that not only is what we thought we are seeing at first wrong, and there's actually a different angle to it and then another angle, but just as in Sensi, the story itself is a construction. And we see the construction of the story by constantly being reminded that what we are watching is a film. It's not true. And that film is broken up in pieces to remind us how different stories are told. Again, there's the complication of the character of the soldier, the main hero character. Croatian soldiers in this film are a very complicated group. Um, they're a complicated group uh, from the fact that one of them is extremely ethical to the fact that none of them ends up wanting to kill a little girl in order to hide a witness to his own misdoing. And there's a spectrum of soldiers. So they're not all this idealized hero character that the dominant narrative tells us that they are. There's also a complication of other characters. For example, the mother. The mother is the very often the embodiment of the nation. So she is also a hero figure in a lot of Croatian films as well. But here, the mother is fine with the girl being killed because if she isn't, then she's going to lose another son. And she already lost a member of the family in battle. But Brescian also, I think, tries to do something else. By engaging different voices, trying to give word to different perspectives on the war. He's also reminding us that there isn't one singular perspective and there can't be one singular perspective because the war is many things from many different perspectives. The problem with this um, is that he also edits his film in a way that never actually lets this polyphony flourish. He uses different voices as catalysts for the plot to move the film forward but never actually allowing them. And I think part of the reason for this is that film is ultimately supposed to tell us that war crimes are bad, which we know, but it doesn't let all these voices battle it out in the film itself. Um, I will speak a bit more briefly about the next two. So the next two strategies are response to trauma, by which I essentially mean that these films, and again, it's three films, this is my favorite out of them, which I strongly recommend. This is a fantastic experiment in form uh, by Zrinko Gresta, who does something really incredible. He puts a group of psychoanalysts in a room and he says, okay, act out a Croatian nation. And that's literally what the script does, that's literally what they do. But what's really interesting about this film is that ultimately, while it is about Croatia in the present, it can't talk about the past. And it can't talk about the past openly because the main character who is again a veteran soldier, so again, a deconstruction of the soldier veteran, it's hero, can't talk about his traumatic experience. So the trauma is not a, a means that Ogresta uses to unpack his topics or that I use to um, unpack the film. The trauma is in the character himself. And there are two more of these films um, coming out at pretty much the same period. I should have said when I when I define trauma, I use a definition by Mia Kaval, and Mia Kaval uses an individual definition. He says, trauma, traumatic memory, is effectively memory that resists narrativization. If you can't say it, you can't get past it. And in these films, it is always individual soldiers who can't say it, who can't talk about it. And the implication, because they're standing in for national narrative as well, is that the narrative that we've been hearing all along is flawed because it's not the truth. And the truth can be said yet, we're not there yet. And finally, as I already mentioned, film that endorse, film that endorse this dominant narrative, um, number 55, which we mentioned at the beginning. Um, um, I will get back to the questions. I told you I'm very bad with multitasking, but I see that there are a number of questions in the chat. 
So films that endorse the dominant narrative, and this is one of those films that came out in 2014, uh, number 55, about the tragedy of Croatian soldiers who go on a, a surveying mission um, and end up being trapped and killed in a Croatian village. I will not get into the details of this one because I'm running out of time very severely by now, but do feel free to ask me, but it's a very interesting film and actually a very interesting um, story. So shorter on the other two findings, which I think are equally important. Uh, films by Bessie in the past. So these are films that talk about the war, but not by not talking about the war. Instead of focusing on stories of what had happened during the war, they tell stories about the present. They're usually comedies, although not all. I think something has changed since I finished my PhD. And the best representative of this kind of response has been made after my PhD research was completed. But they focus on reconciliation in the present. So they focus on taking on characters who talk about their war experience in very short sentences, breaking down the expectations of the dominant narrative. So usually, for example, in this film, this is a still from 72 Days, a very interesting comedy from Daniel Sherbegia that came out in 2010. In this film, the two neighbors were on two different sides during the war. Uh, this man over here is a Serb. He was not engaged in the war. The shoulder that you see here is a former Croatian soldier. And through multiple short sentences of dialogue between the two of them, you learn that neither was he a heroic soldier, nor was the Serb one a brutal enemy. In fact, they kept friendship throughout the whole war. The Croatian soldier saved uh, his Serbian neighbor in a number of occasions. But the reason why we understand what these men are talking about is because we are familiar with the dominant narrative that they're referring to. So they're literally talking to each other, but at the same time, they're talking to what we know about the war. Now, the problem with these films is they effectively bypass any kind of substantial question about what had happened during the war. For example, they touch on no war crimes on any side, any kind of major disagreement. They reduce the dialogue to the very basic, small human story um, and present it as the agency for the war was somewhere else. So on the one hand, they achieve something very commendable in terms of uh, the narrative of memory. They kind of expose it as fraudulent and kind of silly. On the other hand, they don't really tackle anything that's really problematic about what had actually happened. And then the final group of films that I call film assuming the past are perhaps the most interesting to me, although as films, they're probably the least interesting. So you probably noticed that up until now, we've talked about films that thematize the war. The first group of films actively talk about the war, actively represent the war. They create stories of the war. These are films that would normally be considered in memory studies literature as memory films. This is what Astrid L calls them. Films that produce narratives about the past. And these are films that are, she also labels them as memory productive. So they produce a version of what had happened. But when I started looking into all these films, the first thing that I noticed was these are not the only films that are impacting memory. Because when you look at creation films from 2000 onwards, a lot of films refer to the war, but never actually say much about the war. And the reason why those films work for the Croatian audiences and probably for the regional audience as well is because those audiences are familiar with the dominant narrative. So when we see somebody casually mentioning something about the war, we can deduce what they mean just by those casual mentions. We are reminded of the narrative that we are already supposed to know. And so I call these films, films assuming the past because they assume that we have a memory of, that we have a memory of the war. And every time that we watch them, they reinforce that memory. But there's also something very different from these films than from the films that I talked about before. You've probably noticed when I talked about the theory of how I was thinking about it and how I was conceptualizing the where films sit, are they cultural, are they political? I talked about the importance of interpreting these films, of talking about these films. It was written in the news. I noticed that there was a story. That's what contributes to memory making. But these films don't work like this. They work on an individual level. We see them by ourselves. And it is the viewer directly who is asked about this. We don't talk about these films as memory films because they don't produce their own narrative. But they do something to us when we watch them, potentially. And these are just two examples of films that invite us to write in very different narratives. Prezimiti Uriu, which is a film about 
the catastrophic life of war veterans in then contemporary Croatia asks us to feel sad about the veterans. Why would we feel sad about the veterans? Because they were our heroes. How do we know that they were our heroes? Because we know the story of the war tells us so. On the other hand, there's Find Dead Girls, which is um, not a film about the war at all. It is a film about a lesbian couple in Zagreb. But there's a character in that film of a veteran soldier who now keeps terrorizing his neighborhood building by constantly playing loud music. And we are invited by how he is presented to be frustrated by him. And we are frustrated, we are meant to be frustrated because the whole narrative that we know is a lie and it allows us to be terrorized even 10 years after the war. So that's what's really interesting about these films. What's really problematic about these films is where do we draw the line? When is a film assuming the past? And when it's just an innocent dimension, a context? And this is a problem that I'm still kind of working on. Now, I've way overstepped my time. I can see Nicolina in the corner going, yes, yes. So I will not tell you about this. This is my last slide, but I will not tell you about this. I will thank you for being extremely patient with me thus far in this very chaotic covering of a lot of material that I did. And I will ask you if you have any questions, any comments. I will also have a look at the chat because I, I haven't had time to. I'm very bad at multitasking. Um, but uh, thank you very much for, for your attention. I really appreciate it. And I hope I've at least conveyed a little bit of enthusiasm um, for, for this uh, dynamic between film and memory, even if not always in clarity what the film actually does. Thank you very much, Tamara. It was great. I mean, uh, I enjoy listening to you and well, I've watched most of these movies. So um, I think it's, it's, very, it's very important to look at these dialogues. Well, before I start, because I can ask you what I have to ask you at any time, but does anyone have any questions or comments? We have one question about the documentary that you yes. mentioned. Yes. I'm trying to remember the name of the documentary. Um, the author of the documentary is Miroslav Sikavica, and it's called, it's called Louder Than Bombs. You might also remember it, Nicolina. I yes. think it's called Louder Than Bombs. Uh, not louder than weapons. Okay, Sonia has a comment. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. I came later, so I didn't hear the beginning of uh, the film 55. And I, I'm also very grateful, Tamara, and to you, Nicolina, because I found uh, recently that it's really important subject. I have to say I skipped uh, the most of the films because uh, I have my personal trauma. <laughs> Uh, Nicolina knows a little bit, so I, I just can't watch it, but I forced, forced myself, I forced myself to watch 55. Mm -hmm. So I cannot tell you how shocked I was by the manner that that film is made. So making Croatian soldiers like humans and make the uh, enemy as non-human, that is beyond the the way that i can comprehend the the film work so uh i would really like to invite you immediately <laughs> to come to croatia so that we can expand this it's utmostly important we have to talk about it 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 uh, affects the generations and generations you know where i found that movie on youtube uh, and uh, the title of the holder of youtube channel it's called Patrioti or something like that, mm -hmm. but there is also a hall of, you know, Ustashophilia and things like that that promotes that. So it is utmostly important that we talk about it. And uh, I just want to mention that. Thank you so much for opening. I will try to see more of the films and to be able to kind of join discussion in a more um, constructive way. Thank you so much, Tamara and Tinkolina. If I can just take a second to thank Sonia for this comment. Uh, this is a particularly interesting film and I absolutely agree. I actually just talked about a different paper that touches on this film in particular a couple of weeks ago, because this is a film for those of you who haven't seen it. Um, it is a national tragedy, tragedy that is framed as an action film. And what makes it particularly dangerous is that this is a film that is extremely well done. And I think also with good intentions, it is made by a former veteran. It is the first in the series of films about 
the, the so-called Homeland War that is to be funded by the Croatian National Television, depicting important battles that took part during the war. And so this is a film that covers what is a very known um, Croatian tragedy about the soldiers who died. But how it does this is it takes over the genre of action film and very specifically, it draws on the film of John Carpenter. So what happens, for those of you who haven't seen Assault on Person uh, 3, um, Precinct 13, what happens in that film uh, is that a similar thing is repeated with gangs. So you see this group of righteous policemen who are continuously attacked by a swarm of gangs. And these gangs are literally swarming out of nowhere, being killed and then disappearing like in a video game. And so Milic transports this into his film in which the game zombies swarming is the enemy. It is the most dehumanizing um, representation of enemies that I've seen in any Croatian film, because it combines this swarming that is an element of genre uh, with the standard tropes, which we also didn't get to talk about, but there's a set of standard tropes in Croatian film um, in how you depict the enemy. So they're bearded, they're fat, they are very ugly, they're extremely um, disobedient, they're drunk, as opposed to the good Croatian soldier, the hero veteran, who is in this film in particular, uh, let me just see if I can show you the photo again so that you can see what I'm talking about. So in this film in particular, uh, this is the main character, Tomo, uh, who is a very prominent Croatian actor, but you can see that they are mostly rather handsome. They are all, he has a rosary around his neck. So this is where the discussion they hold all the came out. <laughs> uh, very, very handsome, uh, very sweet, uh, very nicely built up actually. You don't get to learn much about these soldiers, but you get to introduce you, you're introduced to them in a much better way than you are to the enemy, who is this completely dehumanized, zombie-like character swarming out. Um, so it's this is a very standard representation of Croatian soldiers in the 1990s. The fact that this repeats itself in 2014 is, I mean, it is extremely interesting, but you could also say that it is very, very problematic. So thank you very much for bringing up that particular yeah, thank you i just wanted to add also at the very beginning of the film it said in the black and white letters it is true story and yes. you know just taking that story of creation tragedy of these soldiers out of the complete narrative of pakrachka poljana medachki jeb and so on it simplifies you know that narrative of the war and of course uh, it gives uh, uh, takes it out of the context so it's not diminishing the tragedy but exactly as you uh, described the way that it does and also the way that it takes it takes it out of the whole context of the war i'm working now on pavilion 22 on zagreb velisayam you know concentration camp practically mm -hmm. that was in the middle of the city so i have to say it is a lot it is very connected to kind of engaging people who later went to, to Pakrat, right? With uh, a kind of grooming uh, uh, soldiers uh, for, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's just there. Yeah, we Thank have to so talk much about for, it. Thank when, you, Tamara. When Tamara comes to Zagreb, we'll meet with Sonia and- Absolutely. Uh, yeah, um, we have one question in the mess in the um, chat, and Matthias also has a question. So, whichever uh, Tom says, uh, my question is a bit more generalized. What are the chances of having various war narratives actually exist in the media space of two neighboring countries? What I mean to say, isn't this expected governmental behavior to have where every country aims to control its war narrative to bolster troop morale? national cohesion, et cetera. Have you found perhaps any cases where this was not the case? Where one I mean, would find different war narratives coexisting in a single national media space? And he loved the Bakhtin reference. This is an excellent question. Um, and I think there's, um, the easy answer to that question is, we tend to assume that as we move from a more autocratic to a more democratic system, we also move from these monologic narratives to the more dialogic narratives. But what I mean by this is that we move from a very single, simple A to B, only this is true possibility, to a murkier narrative that can also sustain, um, at the same time, the notion that war crimes were committed and that there was also a need for a defensive war. I don't think that this is, and at one point, um, so my thesis is not chronological. I should have probably said that when I was analyzing films, I wasn't analyzing all films chronologically because I analyzed them as different types of responses. But within all of these groups, there is of course chronology. And what is interesting is that at one point, 
somewhere from early 2000s to around the end of 2010s, there is actually more and more of the way uh, of these films challenging the dominant narrative. Think about Cernsey, for example. So Cernsey is not a film that says, well, not, nothing about this war was just. Cernsey is a film that says the singular narrative that we have of the war is problematic because the singular narrative leaves things out. Now, that is not the same as to say people really died in this war and some died for a legitimate cause and others didn't. And some did not commit war crimes and others did. So the whole narrative is complicated. And I think opening up to the complexity is the acceptable and it is not unheard of. Think about the standard discussion is the discussion in Germany about what had happened in the Holocaust. It is not impossible to say, well, we've done our nation, in the name of our nation, horrible crimes were committed. And at the same time also, well, there were people in Germany who also suffered. It is not a unified narrative. It is a complex narrative that includes a lot of stream. And opening up the narrative to complexity is rightfully dealing with the memory. It is having films about Serbian national, Serbian nationality victims in Croatia as well, perhaps, or something else. But I think it is possible. I think speaking of a single narrative is, is a little bit illusionary. Yeah, Although but, I see that Tom disagrees. But I would also say that there, it also depends who finances the film. That's a different question. And thank you for saying this. So we have in Croatia, uh, let me say this, zero research about the relationship between film funding and film production. We don't know anything about that process. And when I started working on this, PhD, this stream of the PhD that ended up being this thesis, my first idea was, let me look at that. Let me try to go to our film centers and say, can you give me at least the list of people who applied for funding, the list of people who got funding, and the justifications for why they got the funding throughout this period? Unfortunately, not in Croatia and not in Serbia do they keep this data. This data and is also, to sorry to interrupt you, you cannot even get the data on the rating of the movies that were produced by Croatian Radio Television. Another There's thing, we have absolutely no idea how much viewership these films have. Yes, exactly. uh, thank you again to Sonia who said, and this is why I'm very careful when I say that these films are memory films. I call them memory offerings because I have no idea what their yes. actual impact is. And the reason why I don't know is because we have absolutely no research that asks people even how many films you have seen. I recently did a paper with a colleague uh, from Serbia that has nothing to do with memory, but we looked at popular cinema in the countries of now former Yugoslavia. What are the audiences watching since independence? And what came to be was that some of the films that were seen as biggest failures in Croatia, for example, there's a, this particular film called Halim in Put by um, uh, uh, Arsene Anton Ostojic, which was a complete flop in the theater. This film is on YouTube with a million viewers. And keep in mind that YouTube often gets things put and then taken down, put and taken down on various different channels. Who is watching these films? We have no idea. The television stations not giving any data. It is impossible to know, even for, because most of you will know Croatian television has this online platform but where you can watch films. We have no idea who is watching, how many people are watching, no idea. So, the actual impact, you probably are guessing this, but my next step that I want to take this into is trying to kind of grasp what the impact of, of these films actually is and how are people seeing, processing, viewing these films. Whether this is going to happen is a good question. Academia is um, always a, a strange beast, but this is what I would like to do. Yeah, I tried, but no. I couldn't get the data. No, you absolutely can't. They don't even, uh, like, there's no response to, to, to this. Yeah, Matthias has a question and he got up very early to listen to Tamara. Sorry, Matthias. Yes. Argentina, no. so please, Matthias. Thank you very much. It was very, very interesting. I'm really happy I get up early in order to, to see this. Uh, I, I was um, thinking about asking about the state funding of the films, but you already answered this, so I, I'm late with the question, but no, I was thinking um, maybe if we don't know this connection, maybe there is, I'm interested to know if there is another connection with some state agencies. Maybe the Ministry of Veterans are promoting some films and I want to know if you know something about that. Uh, this is very it. interesting. Yes, and 
also, um, well, just a little comment uh, uh, about who saw this Kalim input. This film was presented here in Buenos Aires four years ago in a, in a mm -hmm. I don't know. In... European Film Festival. Yes, Nicolina, thank you. <laughs> uh, and also, it was, it's a very good film, very good film. But um, I also was thinking about if you're interested, maybe sometime in the future, to do some kind of comparison with the movies about uh, the uh, national uh, I don't know how to translate in English, you know, the, because it was also uh, like a myth founding. For, for the state, and there is a lot of movies about partisans during the uh, what, in Yugoslavia. Maybe there is some uh, things, points in common, how to build this narrative, like a war as a point of foundation, you know, for our identity and our country, you know, uh, th that narrative in Yugoslavia was one of the main pillars of building identity. Now, mm -hmm. the Rat is another very big pillar. So maybe in the films, you, you, there is something maybe if you, uh, if you are interested in look to that, I don't know. You know, evidently you look, you like to watch films, so it's uh, another excuse. But uh, really, it, um, it was very interesting. Thank you. And I was thinking uh, as I was listening to you that uh, it's also um, impossible in some way to avoid talking about the war because it's, the consequences are present in in every film i mean if you talk about croatian if you're making a film about croatia croatia right now you will have war maybe there is a veteran maybe there is some who lost a family it's like well, it's totally present so it's very interesting to to look the ways the war appear maybe more clear maybe more subtle uh, and maybe they sometimes they don't want to um you know confront the narrative but maybe they told a story that uh, unintentional, they confront it anyway. So it, it was very interesting how you try to see all these things. I, I learned a lot. So thank you very much. I will shut up. Thank you. Thank you so much for this lengthy comment with actually a lot of uh, things for me to think about. And one thing that I do want to say to this is that there is often, even in Croatia, there's often the impression that the Croatian films are boring because all of them are about the war. In fact, when I started analyzing these films, it turned out that while war is indeed very much present, it is less present in Croatian film than uh, we usually tend to think. And out of the 121 film or something like that that I started with, I ended up analyzing 38 because the rest of them had very little to do with the war at all. Now you could say, well, yes, but some of these films are, you know, thematizing economic uh, situation or they're thematizing human relations. And all of this is in a way, in fact, uh, affected by the war. And this might be true. But what was really interesting for me is that um, in a lot of these films, the war was not present as context at all. I think what we need to pay more attention to is those films where the war is present as context. And that's kind of what I'm trying to hint when I'm talking about this films of assuming the past, because I think we have much more films that we should be looking at than just those that create a narrative, tell us how the war was, tell us who the hero was. And now the question is not quite easy, how do we how do we do this? But there's also a lot of Croatian films that don't really demonize the war. And I'm thinking specifically in the last couple of years. So I, I'm extremely lucky because at the end of every year, I, I usually get to see everything that was done uh, in terms of fiction films. And I, in the last two or three years, most films have not been about the war at all. You now have films for the younger generation about TikTok stars traveling across Yugoslavia to go to Turkey. You have romances, you have films that don't really thematize the war. And in a way, that is good. War is not the only subject. But in a way, it's also interesting for me, um, why are these things shifting? And why are we now, in the last couple of years, also going back to the very um, early understandings of this narrative of the war as it once was in the 90s as, and as it is in political understanding? For example, the most viewed film in Croatia a couple of years ago was a film about General Ante Gotovina, who some of you might be familiar with. So the life story of the most contested Croatian hero slash villain of the Homeland War. And that this film was made in, I think, uh, 2017, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and that it repeats word after word, everything that is in the dominant narrative, probably the most straightforward case of, of saying, this is how the war was, defensive and just and led by this a soldier hero was quite baffling to me 20 years after the war. So 
that's one thing that is quite interesting. How are we shifting, moving, and why? And the other one was this idea of who funds the films. It's not just the, so Croatia has a fairly independent system of film funding. Um, yeah, yeah. So Sonia reminding us of uh, Christian Milic making more films about um, about the war, which is also true. And uh, last year there was an independent production that was also quite interesting directly about the war. But I wanted to say something about funding. So in the 90s, it was quote unquote opportunistic to make films about the war because the films were funded directly from the Ministry of Culture. And the Ministry of Culture funded whatever they thought would be appropriate to fund. But this has not been the case since early 2000s. So there's an independent body that gives films on tenders based on uh, artistic criteria um, decided on by artistic councils, which include members of the filmmakers uh, organization as well. So this is not a case of, um, you know, in Croatia, you have to make films about the war and those films have to be of a certain way. In fact, the diversity of films that I get to discuss is, I, I hope, a uh, demonstration that this is not the case. But every once in a while, a film does appear that gets special support by the Ministry of veterans, the Ministry of Defense, including, for example, the film about um, Ante Gotovina. And then that film is also endorsed by highest political levels, for example, in the case of uh, the general, the film about, actually, let me show you, I think I have a poster here as well, just to see what it looks like. Um, so this is- But this it was film. also made a series of eight sequels, This is also, yes, this is also a series that's available on Croatian public television. But when this film came out, uh, when it premiered, first time publicly, the then president of Croatia, Kolinda Grabar Kitarovic, went on to say for the media, I hope this film is seen by the world and will show the world the truth about the homeland war. So we are still very much stuck in this um, battle of, of uh, dominant memory versus other memories. And it's interesting that this plays out in um, cinema. At least for me, it's interesting that it plays out. And I'm obviously a little bit subjective. And it's also interesting that these are usually the films that get funding either from Croatian television or from various ministries um, in the process. Thank you, Tamara. I mean, there's also another thing that we should take into account how the audience gets it, because we could see also that even with the general, which is practically a geography, ne they're never set completely satisfied. Even one general said, if I were uh, if I have been such a wussy mm -hmm. as they portrayed me in the war, in the film, we would have lost the war or things like that. So even with the, 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 the movies where they like praise the, the soldiers, they're never quite content with 55. There was a problem that they weren't wearing a rosary. The, yes. So, so there, you can never content. I mean, the, the, the audience is never satisfied fully, even with the with the movies that confirm the narrative and let alone with one that contested. So it's very interesting to see that too. And very interesting when you say the audience, you mean in this particular case with all of these films, people who took part in the war. So yes, and the audience, are about. Yeah. So they're the main stakeholders, the war veterans that we have like 500,000 that are the main like memory guardians of, 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 of the memory mm -hmm. of the homeland war. So this also intersects with who are the memory guardians, who are the, the, the enter memory entrepreneurs and who are the ones who watch these movies and are watching over whether these movies are confirming the, the, the mainstream narrative or the official narrative or not. I put in the, in the, in the chat Tamar, a link to Tamara's PhD I used it for my article because I compared creation theater and, and, and movie regarding the Homeland War, uh, starting where Tamara stopped. Uh, but yes, I referred to her PhD. It's a very thorough and in-depth analysis. I would recommend you to read that work and other Tamara's works. I really enjoy reading them. And I don't know if you have any final comment or if anyone has any more questions. Uh, we can also give you Tamara's email if you wish to ask her. Yeah, further. absolutely. If you would, if you would have any questions, always feel free to get in touch. I, I'm very happy to. Uh, I would also be very happy to hear from people who perhaps work and because there's very Croatian uh, film community is small, but it somehow turns out that if we work on these topics and there are very good scholars working on ideology in film at the University of Zagreb, I have to say that as well. But we somehow still haven't really gotten to unpacking this whole um, issue. And I'm not sure if it's because um, it is just seen as 
kind of irrelevant. We, we tend to treat pop culture as something that's a bit trivial and we tend to treat film as part of pop culture or it is for other reasons like access to data. Um, there's also huge issues. I'm now trying to move the project in, in the other, because I, I found myself in the, in the position of text interpreter and this is not necessarily a position that I wanted to be in. So I'm now trying really to look at how people consume and, and engage with these films. And the problem there is um, the research design. So how do we capture this best? So it's a little bit of a challenge as well. There's, there isn't many audience studies on film reception because it's very hard to, uh, conceptualize and, and, and build a good uh, research methodology around it. But I hope um, maybe to, um, then maybe there's more interest in this in, in the near future. Thank you very much, Tamara. Thank you everyone for attending this seminar and we'll see you next Thursday as, as always. And I've put Tamara's email if anyone has any further questions or wants to contact her or invite her to their center to give a lecture. Uh, she, she is a great uh, teacher too, I mean, great professor. So I would recommend her for everything, even for a coffee, of course. Okay, thank you very much, Tamara, once again. Thank you for having me, really, thank you it's a very, pleasure. Very. Take Thank care you. and hope to see you in Rijeka or in Tres again. <laughs> you too to meet again. Yes. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.